Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Darby Love. I'm an adult services librarian with Vancouver Island, uni uh, not university, Vancouver Island Regional Library. I don't want to change jobs, I swear. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. We're talking about shade loving perennial crops today with Cameron Smith. And before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Stananas and um, Sunemo First Nations. And we're not under the same roof today, but you could put in the chat where you're coming from. Um, we love seeing where you're located and Petra's from North Nanaimo too. So we, we like seeing the reach of this program. That's one of the cool things about it. Uh, we'd also like to extend our huge thanks to the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association for partnering with Pharrell in this program. And a big thanks to Joanne Canning for her key role in creating the program and to Richard Bernier, whose face you can see ensconced in plants there uh, for taking on the coordinator role this year. So just some housekeeping items. We are recording the session. Nobody's image or personal information will be captured in the recording at all. Um, your questions and things will just get, get answered um, without saying your whole name and your street address or anything like that. And please do use the chat feature. We have the Q&A for your questions. That's the um, a great place for all the questions for Cameron at the end. If you've got uh, ones that are kind of like a burning question, Richard can help answer them throughout Cameron's uh, talk in the chat part, but you can definitely use the Q&A um, so that we don't miss stuff. Okay. Um, I think that is about it. So Cameron has been a VIMGA member for 10 years and is a graduate of VIU's horticultural technician program. His gardening efforts focus on food crops, West Coast native plants, and ornamentals for pollinators, and also beauty. He served as VIMGA's treasurer and webmaster and designed and impl implemented their website, vimga.org v-i-m-g-a dot org take it away cameron all right shade loving perennial crops just before we start a uh, bit of little ease uh, the vancouver island master gardeners association is a chapter of the master gardeners association of bc we're a registered nonprofit. We are part of an international organization of trained volunteer teacher, teachers and consultants who work in partnership with public sector agencies and private uh, organizations to teach and promote science-based, sustainable horticultural knowledge and methods. This seminar is the property of the Vancouver Island Regional Library and the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association intended for educational purposes only. Uh, it is copyrighted, so copying and or commercial use of uh, all or part of the seminar is prohibited without express written consent from the library and VIMGA. Uh, the information is science-based, accurate to the best of VIMGA's knowledge. Use of this information is at the sole discretion, responsibility and liability of you the user. All right. Now, without that out of the way, what we're going to talk about today are seophytes, uh, which is any plant that tolerates or thrives in low light, shade. Comes from the uh, ancient Greek skia and phyte. Uh, and this is opposed to a helio heliophyte or a sun loving plant. We're also going to talk about mushrooms. Um, mushrooms uh, obviously don't need uh, light. They, they like the shade. Uh, and mushrooms are perennial. And we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, mushrooms are any of the uh, fleshy fruiting bodies, uh, typically above ground, um, of fungi. So we've got several types of uh, mushrooms there, and we'll be uh, visiting all of them later. All right, what is shade? 
Um, we're all familiar, or most of us will be familiar of those little icons that we see when we buy a plant. And they range from full sun, which means six or more hours of uh, full sunlight a day, part sun, four to six hours per day, part shade, four to six hours per day. These two are really used interchangeably. And what I've done here is I've just decided, all right, part shade means it's okay with less than four to six hours a day. Part sun means it prefers more than four to six hours a day. And then we have full shade, which is less than four hours per day. So the shade loving, and that's what we're going to concentrate on today, are those in the part shade and full shade. What's a perennial? Well, a perennial is a plant, or in this case, a plant or a fungus, that lives more than two years. Uh, this is as opposed to an annual, which completes its entire life cycle in one year, or a biennial, which completes its life cycle in two years. A perennial lasts more than two years. Herbaceous perennials, which is what we're going to be dealing with uh, here, dies back to the, no, that's not true. Um, we'll be doing more than herbaceous, but a, an herbaceous perennial is one that dies back to the ground over the winter. So it doesn't leave anything above ground. Short-lived perennials uh, only last a few years from three to um, four or five, as opposed to long-lived, which can last for 50 years or more. Uh, and then woody perennials are trees and shrubs and lianas. Lianas being woody vines like wisteria. And we're not going to get into those uh, tonight either. Why grow perennials? Perennials tend to be much lower maintenance than an annual. Uh, if you think about uh, your annual vegetable garden, how much work it goes into uh, the planting, the weeding, um, setting up irrigation systems or standing there with a hose, uh, watering it down. Uh, perennial gardens can need less watering, partly because they have deeper roots and can draw on uh, deeper re water resources, less weeding, uh, they tend to have a much more extensive canopy than an annual garden, and so they can shade out a lot of the uh, a lot of the weeds that might otherwise uh, um, sprout. Uh, they tend to be more pest resistant. Uh, a lot of this comes from uh, greater reserves of energy in the uh, in the root system, uh, which makes them. Uh, much more resistant to uh, all sorts of diseases and other pests. Perennials build soil. Uh, there's no tillage. So you don't have to dig up your garden to, to plant um, and you don't have to uh, dig up as much of your garden in order to harvest. There's still some digging for um, uh, tubers and uh, other perennial uh, roots. Um, roots and leaves, uh, you know, a, a perennial isn't static. It's roots and leaves uh, continually decompose and regrow. And that's exactly what we want as it deposits more organic material in and on the soil. So it's continually building new soil. Perennials tend to extend the harvest. Uh, a lot of perennials have uh, harvest times that are outside of the regular uh, harvest times of your annual vegetable garden. So you can, uh, you can harvest earlier, you can harvest later, you can harvest right through the winter in a lot of cases. Perennial gardens are multifunction. They can be edible, which is what we're talking about tonight. 
Uh, they can also at the same time be ornamental. They can be used as hedges and ground cover. Uh, we'll see uh, a, a very interesting ground cover that I just ran into uh, recently, uh, which is edible and also native, which is good. Um, hedges habitat for beneficial insects so that they can be much more pest resistant. Growing perennials. Wanted to mention food forests, um, which is uh, one way of growing an edible uh, perennial garden. With a food forest, what we're trying to do is uh, mimic the way nature works. So it's often visualized as a series of levels from the canopy, the large fruit and nut trees, which tend to absorb a lot of the light. So they're not shade loving. Uh, the low tree layer, the shrub layer. By the time we get down to the shrub layer in, in a food forest, we're starting to think more shade loving plants. Uh, the herbaceous, uh, the uh, root vegetables, uh, and the soil service, ground covers, strawberries, that sort of thing. And uh, finally, layer seven would be the, the climbers, the vines and lianas. Now it tends to be um, inherently shady, but what you can do when laying out a food forest is um, lay it out sparsely in certain areas so that you can put in some plants that really want um, the full sun. It tends to be much more diverse, obviously, than a, than a monocultured uh, garden or crop. And so you have uh, a lot of, um, again, beneficial, uh, beneficial insects. Uh, tends to be a lot less, a lot more resistant to disease and uh, insects. It's a, this is one way of laying out uh, um, a shade garden. Uh, there are other ways as well. All right, let's talk about plants, our zoophytes. What we're going to do here is we're going to go through uh, a number of plants that are edible, perennial, and love shade. This was not an easy task. And I must admit, I didn't come up with a whole heck of a lot of them. So let's see what we've got. Um, let's start with what's wrong with shade. Why are we talking about um, shade as something special? Almost all plants need light. Uh, light hits chlorophyll inside a, a leaf and converts, and that, uh, and the chlorophyll then converts that light into carbohydrates. The carbohydrates are used to fuel the maintenance and growth of the plant. So without light, uh, a lot of these plants just can't exist. There are some parasitic plants which do not contain chlorophyll and therefore do not require light to survive, but there aren't very many of them. And we certainly don't want any of them in our gardens. So what we wanna do is work with plants that can um, work with some shade. How does it do that? This is how zoophytes work. What we're seeing here is a cross section of a leaf with the upper surface of the leaf and the, uh, at, on, on the top of the upper surface, no, sorry. On the top of the upper surface is the cuticle. Oh, let's go through the points first. Uh, Shade-loving plants tend to have narrow stems and longer internodes. They have fewer branches. 
the leaves are large and thin. Now, this is where it really starts to make sense. Um, large and thin because a larger leaf is going to collect more light. Thin because the light needs to penetrate into um, the interior of the leaf. The chloroplasts plasts are larger. The chloroplasts are those um, little green circles you see inside the larger squares and circles. They are where the, the chlorophyll resides. So a larger chloroplast means more chlorophyll and therefore more light gathering uh, and light um, conversion. The epidermis, which you see on the top and bottom, is thin walled again so that more light can pass through. The cuticle is also thinner. The cuticle is that thin transparent layer you see on the very top and on the very bottom. The cuticle is there to, it, it's a waxy uh, coating. It helps prevent uh, diseases from entering in. It, uh, it just protects the surface of the leaf. A thinner cuticle means, again, more light getting through to those chloroplasts. Um, the stoma you see down on the bottom. This is uh, an opening in, in the lower and sometimes upper surface of the leaf. This is where gas exchange occurs. Um, fewer stomata overall, uh, but more tend to occur on the top surface of the leaf. Uh, the palisade layer tends to be poorly developed. That's the uh, layer of large cells you see near the top of the uh, cross section. Spongy layer is well developed. Shade loving plants generally have greater vegetative growth, uh, less flowering and less fruiting. Uh, and you can certainly see that if you try and put a heliotrope in the shade, uh, it just doesn't do as well. Uh, less flower, less fruit. Seophytes are, are pretty much the same, but do better than, than a helio, heliophyte. All right, let's get into it. Hostas. Hostas are edible. Um, Pretty much all uh, of the plant is edible. The hostens or shoots, which emerge in spring, can be eaten raw or stir fried. You can treat them pretty much like uh, asparagus. And what I found is that with a lot of these, they talk about the, the shoots coming out in the spring being edible, and they all say treat them like asparagus. So that's what we'll do. The younger leaves uh, are tender and sweet. You can use them in salads and so on. Older leaves, use them like spinach. You can put them in a stir fry. Um, and the website Rural Sprout has a list of recipes using hostas. And there you have the, uh, the URL. Quite an extensive list too. I was quite, quite impressed. Hostas can live in full shade. Uh, they like a loamy soil, not too wet, not too dry. Keep it moist, but not too wet. Rhubarb. With rhubarb, it's the leaf stalks or the petioles that, that are edible. The leaves themselves uh, are not edible. Most of us know that. It's just too rich in um, oxalic acid, which uh, can be uh, quite poisonous. Um, the uh, You can use them in sweet dishes like crumbles or in savory meat dishes. I often use rhubarb stalks as a replacement for celery. They can be pickled with tarragon and mustard seed. Leaves are not edible. 
yeah, found this one kind of interesting. The leaves can be used for cleaning metal, tanning leather, uh, and controlling insects. Uh, and the boiled root can be used apparently to lighten hair color. They like part sun, uh, although I found that uh, part shade uh, going on to full shade is still acceptable. You just won't get what you see here, a big uh, healthy plant like that. Um, keep them moist. They are heavy feeders, so keep fertilizing them uh, throughout the year. Ostrich fur. This is one I didn't know about. Um, if you look behind the, uh, the text there, you can see the fiddleheads. When you get fiddleheads in the spring from the East Coast, those are ostrich ferns. Uh, it's a native to the East Coast, to Eastern North America. And uh, they spread by Stalins, so they can form colonies. Uh, I've been keeping mine in a uh, in a pot because uh, I was concerned about it spreading too much. But now that I've heard, now that I've learned that these are fiddlehead ferns, um, I'm going to let them free and see just what they're going to do in the in the uh, in the yard. Uh, of course, steam or saute the fiddleheads. Serve with hollandaise, butter, or lemon. Fiddleheads can also be pickled. I've never tried that. Sorry, full shade. Uh, loam clay, they, they are okay uh, with uh, wet feet. Uh, keep them moist to, to wet. Caucasian spinach, another new one to me, uh, comes from the Caucasus Mountains, uh, grows up to three meters, needs support, so we've got a, a vine going here. Long lived, up to 50 years. Uh, used like any green leafy, and the flowers are edible as well. There you see the flowers on uh, on the right. Uh, loamy sand, um, part shade, uh, moist but not overly wet. Ramps, also known as wild leek, native again to eastern North America. Uh, these are also uh, very closely re related to Samson, Samson's, Sam Ramson's, sorry. Uh, which are native to, to Europe. Uh, the leaves appear in spring. This is very interesting. The leaves appear in spring and then die down and are replaced by the flower stalks. There you see the flowers in the bottom right. Um, they can form large colonies, although that can take several years. Uh, and you want to harvest lightly in the meantime. Over there on the left, you can see, uh, obviously, uh, somebody has a large colony. Maybe they're monoculturing. Uh, as with alliums, uh, every part of the plant is edible. Um, leaves, stems, bulbs can be blanched, fried, chopped, mixed into all sorts of dishes. You can blanch them, freeze them, pickle them, dehydrate them for, for long-term storage. Uh, full shade. And... Uh, Keep them moist. Giant Solomon seal. Uh, there's Solomon seal and there's giant Solomon seal. Both are edible, but it's the giant Solomon seal that provides rhizomes that may be actually worth uh, digging up. The other ones tend to be pretty small. It can grow up to 1.5 meters. Uh, colony forming, pretty dense and full sunlight, apparently. 
the spring shoots are edible and the underground, underground rhizomes, which we see here, are pretty starchy and uh, are fully edible. Keep them moist or wet, uh, part, uh, part shade. Loamy, clayy, loamy, clayy soil is okay. Wood nettle. This is uh, canadensis, Laportier canadensis, native to North America, uh, related to stinging nettle, but it stinging nettle is a uh, European uh, import. Not much sting as stinging nettle. Uh, it does still have the, the stinging hairs on the stems and leaves, but not as many. Uh, grows to 1.5 meters, clump forming, uh, similar to uh, uh, the stinging nettle. They tend to be harvested later than stinging nettle. So if you have uh, clumps of both, you can start off in the early spring with the stinging nettle and then move on to the wood nettle later on. Using soups, casseroles, anywhere you would use green leaves. Um, if using fresh, steam or blanch them slightly and that will neutralize the sting. Part shade, well draining, keep them moist. Miner's lattice, of course. Um, there's some disagreement about whether it's an annual or perennial, but in any, in any case, it is a, an aggressive self-seeder. Um, I'm, I would swear that they come up in the same spot every year, but I'm gonna have to run an experiment, put one in a pot and not let it go to seed and see if it comes back. They're best fresh in a salad or sandwich. They don't cook very well. They just tend to disappear. Um, when harvesting, pinch just above the bottom leaves so that uh, they will continue to grow. And this is interesting. Uh, they will not uh, turn bitter as the plant is flowering, but will turn pink and bitter in excessive sun. So if you see them turning color, then you know that they're uh, too sunny. Part shade, um, keep them moist. I find they, they dry out um, pretty easily. I have them coming back year after year and I quite like them. Bunchberry. This is uh, Cornus canadensis. It's actually creeping dogwood. And over on the left, you can see the dogwood flowers there. Um, spreads by rhizomes, can form large colonies. Uh, the mature fruit and seeds can be eaten raw or cooked. The, uh, the berries tend to be pretty mealy, uh, apparently. I haven't seen them or tried them, but preserve well. Uh, they can be added to jams, baked goods, and teas. They can, yeah, the berries can make teas, much like rose hips. And again, like rose hips, they contain high levels of pectin. Uh, not surprising since they are part of the uh, rose family. Uh, they'll grow in full shade. So they make a, a great under, uh, great ground cover in the deep, uh, deep forest. Uh, they would like well draining uh, soil, keep them moist. And that's it for the for the uh, zoophytes. Uh, only about nine of them, I think, nine or ten of them. I didn't get into shade tolerant. Once you get into shade tolerant, there, there there's a whole range of edible perennials that you can find. But we decided to do shade loving here. Let's talk about mushrooms. Mushrooms are certainly shade loving. Over on the right there, you can see uh, mushroom anatomy. Uh, 
or his teeth, the stipe, the vulva, mycenium on the bottom. All right, so in this section, uh, most of the information came from uh, Rain Tree Nursery in, in Washington, Morton, Washington. And there's the uh, the website there. If you just start off with raintreenursery.com, I'm sure you can find the, uh, the page on uh, growing mushrooms. I don't know why they say growing fruit, trees, and mushrooms. That page is just mushrooms. So mushroom cultivation, and that's what we're talking about here, is actually cultivating mushrooms uh, done through inoculation of a substrate. So wood chips, logs, sawdust, grain hulls, etc. cetera. Um, and what Rain Tree and various other uh, nurseries and vendors will give you is pre-inoculated pre mushroom spawn either in the form of um, sawdust, which you can then um, spread or um, bury in, uh, in your garden, or dowels. So garden spawn, uh, prepackaged blocks, usually sawdust uh, that have been inoculated with the de desired species. And then you plant that in or place it in piles of uh, fresh wood chips or straw. A dowel, um, wooden dowels that have been inoculated with uh, the desired species. And what you do is you um, cut down uh, logs, cut down a tree. Uh, generally, it's best if it's a fresh tree, a live tree. Um, the point being that if you cut down a dead tree, it's probably already been infected or um, inoculated with other mushroom species, and that will compete with whatever you're trying to grow. So you get this freshly cut wooden log, you drill a hole, and then you place the dowel uh, in there. And generally what you do is you covered over with um, a wax or something similar just to keep it moist. Here we go, oyster mushrooms. Now, these are what we're gonna see. These mushrooms here are the ones that Rain Tree specifically sells. So they spawn, uh, sell spawn for all of these. Again, you'll find that other vendors will give you uh, other types. For instance, I found one that actually sells morels, uh, morel spawn. So that's a possibility. Uh, oyster mushrooms prefer hardwood sawdust or wood chip substrate. Apparently these are really easy to grow. Um, they'll also grow in straw, corn cobs, banana leaves, cotton seed, hull, cotton seed hulls. Good luck on finding that. Newspaper, cardboard. Keep them moist, water weekly. Uh, and they you can also get them as uh, dowel spawn. Uh, put them in fresh logs. Um, easier to keep wet, keep moist. Lovely looking mushrooms. King Strophoria, wine cap mushrooms. Uh, King Strophoria, I've never heard of, but wine cap I'm familiar with. Um, grows in a wide range of lignin-rich substrates, mostly straw, most commonly straw and hardwood wood chips. Uh, best in gardens, bed style of cultivation rather than logs. Uh, apparently they will spread freely um, whenever their preferred food sources are plentiful. So that suggests this is one that you can keep in your garden and just have it spread, which would be nice, a mushroom bed. Uh, it fruits in the early spring and in fall. Portobellos, we're all familiar, or most of us are familiar with portobellos. 
We're also familiar with the immature version criminy or the button mushrooms, white and brown button mushrooms that you see in supermarkets. Um, interestingly enough, the white mushroom, little white mushroom you see there uh, is a mutation discovered in 1925, I think it was, um, while they were uh, cultivating the brown, brown mushrooms. And since then, they've been cultivated um, specifically to be white. Uh, when growing them, they prefer manure or mushroom compost over wood. Uh, best in raised beds and containers uh, with a 50-50 mix of straw and horse manure. Uh, what you want to do with your straw and horse manure is compost it for a couple of weeks in plastic bags and full sun. Uh, then pour into the garden bed and inoculate with the spawn. And it may it can fruit in two to four weeks. So that's really quick. Shiitake, of course. Uh, now we're getting into an intermediate difficulty of mushroom cultivation. Uh, almost exclusively in hardwood chips, sawdust or logs. Um, oak, maple, birch, poplar, or aspen, beech, and apparently Douglas fir. I don't think I'm going to cut down my Douglas firs for, for these, though. Mushroom logs can fruit as often as every five weeks for over five years. Uh, and they should be cut fresh and inoculated on the same day again um, because you want to avoid contamination by other mushroom spores. That's one of the reasons that they're apparently difficult to grow because they uh, just don't take to competition very well at all. Maitake, maitake. Uh, I've never seen these, never heard of them before. Uh, and apparently are very difficult to cultivate. Grows uh, exclusively on wood, oak wood. Slow to colonize. Uh, so again, uh, it has to be freshly cut. Uh, inoculate and incubate indoors for two to three months. And then uh, place outdoors by partially burying logs in a shaded spot, lots of high nutrient compost. Um, typically they won't fruit until years after inoculation. Uh, although the, uh, the website said that you may see an, an initial flush six months after inoculation, but then, uh, then you have to wait. Um, yeah, I found this one interesting. Apparently they'll continue to fruit every year for each inch of log diameter. Um, and perhaps maybe even longer. Lion's mane, very interesting looking mushroom. Uh, Lobster-like flavor apparently. Uh, long incubation period, it may take up to two years before it fruits. Uh, can be cultivated in a wide variety of hardwoods. And again, use larger diameter logs, 10 inches or more. Um, hmm. Having to find a 10 inch tree, live tree to cut down so I can plant my lion's mane. Chicken of the woods. Um, apparently a, a pleasant chicken-like flavor. And that's one of the reasons it's called chicken of the woods. Uh, one of the most difficult to cult cultivate. Uh, again, easily outcompeted by other mushrooms. Uh, inoculate in fresh hardwood logs. Uh, and incubate for two to three months. Um, then again, uh, almost completely burying the, the log outside in uh, rich compost. Uh, keep it well hydrated. 
and uh, fruiting will start um, much, much later. And I think that's it. So the photo credits, I just wanted to point out that uh, all of the uh, illustrations and, and photographs came from Wikimedia Commons. And so all of the credits are on these two pages. Oops. Right. Okay. Back. Thanks, Cameron. Uh, the when you said that lion's mane mushrooms take two years to even start fruiting, it made me feel better that my kit didn't work. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> it's very disappointing. So, did you actually try the lion's mane? My brother gave it to me. Oh yeah. I was so excited. It looks like it'd be so cool. Yeah, yeah. And then the oyster mushrooms, I didn't really like them that much. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. No. So how long has the lion's mane been uh, um, under, well, how long have you been trying it? Uh, it was, I think I tried it last year. Oh, well, yeah. Keep it going. Keep it going. I think I threw it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. That's exciting to know about um, our hostas being all edible. I'd never, never knew any of that before. We have no. a Oh, yeah. Have you, have you, Richard, have you eaten them personally too, or? No, I can't say I've ever tried them, but now knowing that they are edible, I do have hostas in my garden, so I will try them next spring. Maybe Great. make a nice salad. Yeah. I think I might try too. We have a question from Tanya. Which company did you find that sells morel spawn? Oh. Oh. Good question. Hang on a sec here. I did do a Google search and there is um a few places here in Canada that sell uh, spawn. Yeah. Okay, well, while Richard's checking on the morel spawn question, we have one for Cameron. If you don't plan to eat these plants, could all the plants mentioned be grown over a septic field? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, You know, I, I I would say so. I would say sure. Um, I've never really thought about growing on a septic field. Uh, I don't know much about them. Perhaps, perhaps I not. Don't, rooted. I don't think it'd be a problem, basically, because uh, mycelia really actually don't go into you know looking for water and stuff like that well that would be true for organic for the material right that would be true for the mushrooms but i'm wondering about a deep rooted uh uh plant a deep rooted vegetable yeah i'd stay away from planting anything on a septic field other than maybe grass or that's about it you don't want to be messing around with your your field not at the prices they charge to actually provide you with a new septic field. Well, that's a good point, yeah. Um, Gina, if you have a follow-up question that could clarify any of this, please do stick it in there um, as well. Okay, so I did find a website. It's called naturallynorth.ca. And uh, they do sell a morale spawn. It looks like they do sell uh, various others, too. It's just... Mm. 
Yeah, they do sell other uh, mushrooms too. So that's uh, naturallynorth.ca. And I'm just looking up the other one. What's the chat there? Question. Okay. Um. Another Susan question. from Toronto says she tried the sprouts. I'm guessing that was when we were talking about hosta, hosta sprouts. This year, fried in butter with garlic, tasted delicious like asparagus. That's a good idea. So Susan advises frying your hostas in butter and garlic. Uh, okay. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> There's another question in the uh, Q&A. Where do you find what you need to grow mushrooms? What does the beginning look like? Are they seeds? No, not, not seeds. Um, generally what you get um, is either uh, a block of sawdust, which uh, is inoculated, already inoculated, so the spores are already in there or little wooden dowels, which you then uh, insert into logs. Yeah, I think it's important to know that uh, mushrooms uh, spread by spores and spores are not uh, a seed, it's an incomplete. Although they do, uh, do have a sec a sexual um, uh, reproduction also. Could you talk more about that? No. Not right at the moment. I <laughs> <laughs> have to do a little bit of um, information gathering. That makes me feel better because I was like, I don't understand mushrooms at all. <laughs> and, and if you don't have the answer like that, that makes it just no, you know, I don't have complicated. Like that. I'd rather <laughs> actually look up the answer and uh, actually make sure that I'm speaking with correct information. Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. So Cameron, do you have um, like cultivated mushroom areas in your space? I do not. Um, like you, I, I have tried the kits in the past and I have tried to put them out, but obviously did not know what it was I was doing mm -hmm. uh, and they just didn't work. But um, I am certainly inspired uh, to try it again, especially seeing the wide variety of mushrooms that uh, are available and uh, knowing that uh, there, there's lots of good information out there now uh, to keep it going. So I'm definitely going to try it again. I, I don't have much choice, actually, because uh, my garden is quite shady. And I've been trying to grow a, a standard vegetable garden uh, on this property, and it's just not been working. So... Uh, what I have learned by putting together this presentation will be put into uh, effect uh, almost immediately. And I'm just going to start planning a, a, a full shade garden uh, okay. with not only the shade plants, the shade loving plants, but also the shade tolerant plants and mushrooms. I have areas where I could grow mushrooms although everything tends to be a little dry, but uh, I'm sure I can work around that. I, I think if people have any uh, questions on what they can grow in their own shade gardens, I think the best place to look would be your regional, um, not library, but your regional government. Sometimes we'll let you know what, uh, 
what food crops can be grown in shades, some uh, plants that are more uh, indigenous to different areas, like Cam was talking about, uh, like rhubarb and uh, stinging nettle and all these other things. Not everybody has those available to them in their own garden. So I think more than anything, you go to your uh, the, your government website and uh, do a Google uh, a search through it for any um, shade loving crops that are actually grown in your area. I know we have people from Australia. We have people from all over the world. So to to start out with do your research, check your own government sites or uh, your nurseries or anything like that to find uh, to find stuff that will grow in shade in your neck of the woods. I, I just popped into the chat a catalog link for, we actually, I think I might've gone on a buying spree a few years ago for how to grow mushrooms when I thought that I should know how to do that. So um, if you want to give it a better crack than I did, we have about five different titles. <laughs> right. Uh, no more questions, it looks like. Um, I just want to go back to the first, very first question. And I'm going to share my screen again here. Gourmet mushroom products uh, out of California and uh, mushroom growing, mushroom growing.com. And these are some of the mushrooms that they, that they have available. Cool. So it's funny, I'm seeing those kits. They're just like by the self checkouts at Save on Foods. Now too, they're becoming quite a bit more mainstream. Really? Huh. Yeah. I wonder if there would be a problem bringing these into the country. I know there are some things that we're not allowed to bring into the country, but I don't think they would need a, a phyto certificate for, for any of this. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's worth investigation. Yeah. So, um, Cameron, if so, if people have some options, they're going to have some more conventional food sources if they are able to get some more light happening on their properties. Yes. Yeah. So, like, this is making me think of like when Hunger Games was really popular. You're like, yeah, I could forge all this stuff, <laughs> 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 which is really cool. Certainly, um, most people are going to have uh, are going to have gardens with uh, more light than um, these plants either want or or need, and that's when you can start moving into the the part sun uh, uh, vegetables and and other plants. I'll probably wind up with some of those in my garden. I don't have a, it's not all full shade, but it's pretty dark back there. Yeah. And um, just with our, the climate trends, the last few summers, for example, or um, how, how is that affecting some of these plants in, in your experience or that you've been talking to folks? Hmm. I think the biggest thing is just the dryness. Uh, not a lot of plants tolerate both dry and shade. If they prefer uh, shade, most of them prefer moisture also. Yeah. There yeah. is that whole aspect of it. Yeah, as, as we went through the, those plants, of course, most of them said keep moist or moist to wet. Mm -hmm. And right. um, that's going to be a problem here in my garden. I, I tend yeah. to be shady and dry. If you have a wet area and you're uh, wet 
shady area in your yard, well, then that would be a place where you could plant some of this stuff. But uh, keeping in mind that if you have dry shade, then you may end up having to water some, especially with what's been happening with the weather, day-to-day -day weather and the climate here on Vancouver Island. Yeah, I, I've noticed that uh, often what happens when putting in um, new native gardens, you wind up having to irrigate for the first few years until things are well established. So that's probably what I'll wind up doing here, mm -hmm. which will still be a whole heck of a lot better than what I'm trying to do now, as uh, pretty much every year in my annual garden, I wind up having to shift things around as the garden configuration changes. With the perennials, at least everything stays in one spot. And Cameron, are you, uh, you're gardening in uh, Nanus, are you not? No, I'm in South Nanaimo. Oh, okay. So you have a really sandy soil then? I have heavy, heavy clay. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, heavy clay. Um, I've got the, this stand of 75 foot firs that, that I can't touch um, on the south end of the property. So that's what's providing a lot of the shade. And that's what's also making everything so dry is these trees just suck up moisture. Air. Yeah, true enough. Well, if you wait long enough and don't water, guess what? <laughs> the weather, the climate will take its toll on them. It's yeah. been incredible this year looking out of the window here and seeing all the dead uh, cedars that are uh, the cedars that are dying from the top down. Yeah. And even some of the pine trees and the fir trees are all suffering incredibly this year. Well, that's an optimistic note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be good. Either that or we end up having to water more. <laughs> Well, that's actually really interesting hearing um, you talk about needing to support with watering, even when you're establishing native plants, because um, that's something I've been wanting to do in part of my yard. And and uh, having correct expectations is probably important <laughs> to help it Fair. Yes. <laughs> get in there. <laughs> well, two times of the year you can plant, fall and spring. Yeah. I wouldn't be planning anything in the, the summer, but. Um, Bet Mac said, after many successful years, my shade garden has dried out due to stage four and five water restrictions. Oh, no. Many climate adaptations will have to be made. That's just really sad. Yeah, lots and lots of organic material matter in your soil, like amend your soil and lots of mulch. So we should lots of composting um before yeah, amend your soil the more more organic material you have in your soil the better off you're going to be okay so right. like the leaves and grass clippings yep. yeah um mind you uh, grass clippings do get quite high in nitrogen so i would be a little bit leery about placing that around uh, too close to the plants Generally, what I'll do is I'll mix grass clippings in with the leaves, and yeah. that provides a really nice mulch. Yeah, it does. Okay, so mixing them together is good. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bet said, yeah, she amended it to six inches and still still didn't do so well. Um, Ida has asked, is amending tie up the nitrogen? They... There's been a lot of studies done on this, and um, not really. It's only within maybe a couple of millimeters from the soil surface. So no, it, it doesn't really rob the nitrogen from the soil. I think that was uh, changed, that whole uh, idea was changed a few years back, where, you know, uh, amending the soil with a bark mulch or whatever is the, what you need to do. You need to or add organic material to the soil so that you, you, you're shading the ground. So you're not allowing the sun to bake the ground and remove all the water. Okay. 
Um, Ida added that I added manure to a new garden and my squash were yellow. Oh, um, were they supposed to be? <laughs> were they supposed to be yellow? Yeah, that's, I was like, what kind were they? Um, yeah, and it depends on how fresh the manure was. If, it, you know, fresh manure is not something I would be adding to the garden. Well-rotted manure would be a better choice. Yeah, if I ever get uh, fresh manure, it immediately goes into the compost. And uh, I try and do hot compost. So this just makes it hotter and uh, it does. really does does do well for the compost. Well, and you also, the hotter the compost, the less weed seeds you get in yeah. the compost, right? So, you know, a nice hot compost is great. Coal compost is basically what I've done for years now. And I do get a lot of weeds coming up, weed seeds. But yep. if I cover it with a good layer of uh, mulch, just the weeds don't come up. They don't see the light of day. Yeah. Um, do you two have any techniques for um, like capturing Rain, not that we had very much rain, but just capturing your own water um, in your gardens. In my new property, I'm putting in a three thousand dollar, uh, three thousand gallon cistern to collect rainwater off the roof. Nice. Well done. Cool. Yeah, um, the city of Qualicum Beach is really on board with uh, uh, keeping the rainwater. Uh, they. There is no storm sewers in Qualcomm Beach, so it's all surface. So uh, basically, they want you to keep as much rainwater as you can or slow down the uh, the water. So let's say if you've got a drainage ditch in front of your yard to actually add some plants in there, that will actually hold the water back so it just doesn't drain straight out. It allows the water to sit there for a while so it can actually percolate through the ground. Can we ask you more questions about your sister and Richard? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, what kind of roof? Um... It's gonna be buried in, uh, it's gonna be a flat roof. A flat yeah. roof. Uh, the water will be collected off the flat roof and go to an underground cistern. It'll be um, filtered. So I don't want getting debris in the water and stuff like that. Yep. And then it will be pumped out into an irrigation system, which will be drip, drip irrigation system. Wow. So I am, I'm almost toying with the idea of burying the drip system in the soil so that it just actually never sees the light of day. It just actually percolates through the soil. But hmm. I don't know how uh, how that's going to work. So I'm going to have to do more uh, more study on it. This seems like another topic for the future. <laughs> <laughs> One more question: What what like is your roof like tar paper or? No, it'll be um, a membrane roof. A membrane roof. Yeah. So there's solar panels on the roof. Thirty of them. And then uh, the water will be collected off the roof, go into a cistern, and then be pressurized so I can use it for irrigating uh, my roto collection and stuff like that. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Solar panels. You've got sunlight. <laughs> Why did you buy this property? We do have sunlight. <laughs> <laughs> sunlight um yeah and it's not really sunny in the winter time but i'm sure that we can more than uh get enough sun from let's say march april on till september october basically you know this year it would have been a banner year for solar collectors on the island uh yeah yeah yeah, Cameron, indeed. I'm seeing you with like a rooftop vehicle garden <laughs> that you can just drive it to sunny places. Oh, uh, right. Park yeah. it there for a bit. <laughs> you get <hours> a day. <laughs> I'd um, have to see that. 
<laughs> and if you manage to do it, uh, yeah, get a patent on it. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> we have right. a question from Ernestine. I would like to make a hot garden bed. Any tips for types of plants to plant now in September? A hot garden bed. Maybe what do you mean sunshine. by hot? Yeah, sunshine or where? A garden bed in a very hot spot. Probably. Yeah, maybe it's for next summer. And she's wanting to, she's itching to get started on it, I'm guessing. What plants to, actually, you can plant pretty well anything. If you're on the island here, I don't think you're going to have a problem because our wet season is starting pretty quick in the next month or so. It'll be pouring rain for quite a while. So spring and summer would be the best time to plant it. Make sure that you do your homework though. Uh, is it uh, hot as in really hot? Is it in a little uh, facing south against a south wall, south facing wall, or, or is it just out in the middle of a field somewhere? You know, these are all sort of ideas that we need. We need to know. Oh, she's so gonna... it would be a good idea. Box. Box has three weak horse manure, one foot at the bottom. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know if I put something in fresh manure. So when you say fresh, how how it, long, it, how old it, is fresh? <laughs> well, I'm wondering. A three week old fresh manure, uh, horse manure is not. That's fresh. That's still fresh. You oh. know, like manure. We're talking six months. Okay, so our our previous person Ida uh, with her yellow squash, her manure was a year or two old. So that that should have that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. So something and else. And it, it was probably the the color of the squash. Squash actually will yellow as it as it ripens. You know, it'll go from green to yellow. So it could be just a, a yellow squash. It was the leaves, she said. Oh, the leaves. Yeah. Uh, that could be either lack of water. Heat. Or too much light, yeah. too much heat. Yeah. And box has three weak horse manure, one foot from the bottom. Not green, as it actually three months. Okay, a little months. bit older. It was maybe a mistyping. Yeah. Hmm. Well, put it this way, as long as the manure is well rotted, there shouldn't be a problem with planting whatever. Just know how much sunlight that corner of your garden will get. If it's in a frost pocket or if it's on the side of a hill, uh, these are all idea uh, things you really need to know. So uh, a good uh, source for that type of information uh, if you're doing plants or vegetables and that kind of stuff would be uh, uh, West Coast Seed. They have in West Coast Seed, they have a planting table where it tells you what you can plant at a certain time of the year. But uh, apart from that, you can plant pretty well anything at this time of the year. Well, that's kind of exciting. I'm just going to pop that link in for the, uh, they've got different regions. There are two, and um, if you're at Nanaimo North uh, Branch, we printed some for you in color. Mm -hmm. And I've heard uh, you folks uh, encourage people to grab their seed guides because there's such good references. They are very good references. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not seeing any other questions. Well, I guess that's about it. All right. Thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Darby. Uh, yeah, and enjoy your miner's lettuce and hostas, folks. <laughs> yes, I want to hear about your mushroom successes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try not to look too jealous. <laughs> okay.